many of you, if not all of you, uh, will know of a person called Michael Jackson, right? Uh, you will remember that he was a very famous musician, songwriter, singer, uh, and of course he went on to be very uh, a, a celebrity. He was even given the title King of Pop. I remember that uh, you know Elvis Presley, who was also very famous, he was called the King, but Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, through his popularity, became the king of pop. Now, Michael Jackson, in spite of his tremendous fame and wealth that he amassed, he was able to earn. Uh, and of course, the, uh, you know, the celebrity status that he had, there was one problem he struggled with all his life. Now, of course, he had many other problems, which we won't go into now. But one problem that he struggled with was he did not like his image, right? Uh, he just didn't like how he looked. And the obsession of wanting to look differently took him into all kinds of, uh, you know, activities uh, like trying to have, you know, facial plastic surgeries. Uh, he tried to, you know, have a facelift, an eye lift. Uh, he was obsessed with his nose for some reason, and he wanted to uh, make his nose look a little differently. And uh, he tried cheek implants and various procedures to correct facial wrinkles, and he also wanted his color to be different. So he applied various kinds of facial bleach to look fairer. In fact, his biographer, his official biographer said that he wanted to be timeless. He was wanting to be someone he was actually not. And I want to show you how he looked when he was a young person and what he looked like, uh, you know, much later after he went through all those, uh, you know, surgeries on his, uh, on his face. Give me a moment, I'll just uh, share my uh, screen with you and I'll show you the photo. Uh, okay, you might notice that my sermon title is Image Isn't Everything. And this is how uh, Michael Jackson looked. Can you see the contrast? He was a young, the, the, the picture on the left is as he was a young person. And then of course, this is how he looked when he uh, was much older. Many of you know, sadly, he passed away in uh, 2009, and he was only 50 years of age when he died, all right? So I use that image to, you know, help us understand something very important today. You know, we all have a desire to look good. We want our image to be not only acceptable, but, you know, extremely, uh, 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 viewed very favorably by everybody else. We want to look good for others. Uh, not only our physical image, but we want to be regarded very positively by others. So we try our best to project the best image. Uh, everybody tries to do that, isn't it? Now you are looking at me, at my image, on your either your mobile phone or your uh, uh, computer laptop, and I, uh, I, I am concerned that you know. I hope I am looking all right. I hope you like my background. <laughs> I try to make my background look pleasing, which reminds me that uh, some of your images are blank. <laughs> uh, 
Now I understand that some of you wouldn't want your image, you know, to show yourself on the laptop. I can understand that you may have your particular reason, but uh, there is this tremendous desire that we all have that we want to make our image look good. We want to be regarded as good persons or righteous people, right? And what I want to discuss today is that image isn't everything. And that's the title of my message, that the external image we project to others uh, isn't everything about the person. You know, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must be concerned of what we are, not just on the outside, but also what is what we are on the inside. Right. It is not necessarily wrong to have a good image, but it is more important to have the heart right. And that is what we as Christians must understand. And that was what Paul was talking uh, to the Corinthians. Now, uh, in the scripture reading, uh, we missed out a few verses. Actually, the, verse, the reading should have started from verse 6. But let me read to you verse 12. The same uh, passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice in verse 12 what it tells us. It says, we are not commending ourselves to you again. This is the Apostle Paul writing uh, and to the Corinthian church. And he says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not about what is in the heart. You see here, the Apostle Paul is pointing out a major problem that the Corinthian church had. They had a very peculiar problem. They were very concerned about outward appearances. And what happened was there were many preachers and teachers, not necessarily from the Christian uh, you know, uh, faith, but even from other faiths. And these preachers wanted to look very impressive. Uh, they were very rich because they tried to get as much from the others. That they are very smooth talkers, appeared very knowledgeable, and spoke about various kinds of philosophies. And what happened was, through this smooth talk and very you know, suave preaching, the Corinthian church was getting persuaded. They were getting distracted. Uh, they were becoming impressed with just what they were, you know, how they were preaching, uh, rather than trying to focus on what they were preaching. So many of them were swayed by them and began to follow them. They were impressed with status. They were impressed with the external appearances. And the Apostle Paul was telling them, there are so many who boast about outward appearance, but they don't see what is in their heart. And he's asking the Corinthian church, uh, look at us, you know. In fact, some of the Corinthian church, uh, you know, was actually ashamed of Paul. They were becoming so enamored by the other preachers that they were ignoring Paul and not heeding the gospel message that Paul was preaching. And so Paul was trying to help them understand that the message he was bringing was changing the hearts of people, not just outward appearances. That's one of the reasons why, if you remember, uh, reading in the uh, Corinthian, uh, you know, the, the, the church in Corinth, they were very impressed with these tongue speaking. You know, in fact, they had many problems with regards to speaking in tongues. Why? Because speaking in tongues was, you know, uh, had an external appearance of righteousness. It had an external, uh, what you say, appearance of as though they were very close to God and God was using them mightily. But they were actually abusing this gift of speaking in tongues. They were giving false impressions about themselves and actually exploiting the brethren. 
right? And so they were e using this imagery, this false imagery, to mislead people. And that's the reason why the Apostle Paul had to write at least two or three chapters about the misuse of gifts. And we will talk about gifts and fruit of the Spirit a little later. But he was trying to help them understand that they should not be misled by what he called them super apostles, right? He was warning them not to fall for trendy preaching and fashionable beliefs, all right? And if I can uh, just stop sharing for a moment, uh, isn't it the same phenomenon today, right? Uh, a similar problem exists today with regards to uh, what sometimes happens in the church. Today, we have what we call celebrity pastors, right? pastors who are, uh, you know, very trendy, pastors who are very fashionable. They like to drive in, you know, fancy cars or some of them even are fly in big jets. And people are very impressed to see that, right? And uh, some of them also use a lot of gimmicks on, uh, you know, in, in church. Some of them like are more magicians than pastors. <laughs> they try to use magical ways of trying to persuade people. I remember uh, watching a video sometime back, this was, and one pastor actually came onto the stage on a horse because, <laughs> because he wanted to make some point and he was impressed, wanting to people to be impressed with, uh, you know, his appearance and uh, what he was trying to say. But I don't know if they understood what he was actually trying to preach. Right. And uh, talking about entrances, do you know there was one pastor who tried to actually enter the stage? Once again, I'm going back to my uh, screen share. And here is a pastor which I found on the net. Uh, let me just, do you see the image there? This pastor is coming onto the stage on a zip liner. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, he, this pastor is uh, trying to make a splashy, you know, entrance onto the stage. Uh, so I thought I'll just show you that because uh, these are things that are happening today. And I'm just wondering, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, maybe we should ask Praveen to create a zip liner in our church. <laughs> And Praveen and I can come on a zip liner. <laughs> but uh, that is the image that people like to show to people, unfortunately. You see, the, what, is, what is the problem here is when we focus so much on image, the focus becomes on entertainment, right? Many are trying to entertain their churches rather than edify their churches. People get carried away by various styles of preaching rather than the message that they are giving. You know, if it is not sensational, I mean, the physical image, it is sensationalism. They try to, uh, you know, preach things, you know, that are sensational, which may not necessarily be biblical, right? And many a times they are not able to distinguish lies from the truth. People are bored with the simple message of the scriptures. You know, people are bored with what the Bible have to say and people try to bring in all kinds of other stuff, which I like to call Corona theology. You know, there are so many pastors going around preaching Corona theology today. I don't know if you've heard, I've been getting some videos and some pastors are actually telling their members, don't take the vaccine because the vaccine contains metal pieces in it. The vaccine contains chips, computer chips, and things of that nature. Where do they get this information? Not from the Bible, 
like I used to say, you know, they're not reading the same Bible that I'm reading. You know, and so what is happening is there is an addiction to form. And when you get, get addicted to form, you lose the substance. And many today are struggling with image addiction. All right. But uh, God looks at the heart. And I like the song that was played today. We had Pearl singing that for us. Uh, God searches much deeper than the image. And he is looking into the heart, like the song says. Now, I want to make a clarification. I'm not saying that image is all bad, you know, or that we should ignore our image. I'm not saying that we should accept shabby, shabby looks or deliberate, deliberately ignoring our image. I'm not saying that we should neglect grooming ourselves or look presentable. Uh, nothing wrong uh, to take care of decency and decent looks. But here is the problem. The problem is when the image replaces the substance, or you could say the heart, then when the image becomes more important than the heart, there we begin to have problems. There we then begin to have false images being projected. You know, the image then is glorified rather than the substance. What we must understand is the heart is more important than the image. It is the heart, in fact, that gives us the right image. When you have the right image, it's the heart that, you know, it, it influences the heart and the image becomes correct. You know, spending all the time to manicure Im your image or ignoring the heart is futile, a complete waste of time. You know, our fixation with earthly image can become a distraction for the deeper reality of knowledge and, uh, and the reflection that we need to have of Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it can stunt our growth as a Christian if too much of importance is given to image. You know, the obsession with image is like being in a prison. Uh, the more you focus on it, the more you focus on the external, the more it will distract you from the substance. And the more you get distracted from the substance, the more you become imprisoned. You become a prisoner of your own image. And so, brethren, uh, there is uh, a, a need for us to recognize uh, that there is a more important image we need to focus on. You see? Like I said, it's not wrong for us to have a good image, but it cannot be to the expense of the heart. And we need to have the right image. And there is this more important image in the Bible that we need to take notice of. And so let me, for the remaining time, spend a little time on talking about the right image we need to have. You know, all of us are made in the image of God. You and I were created in the image of God. But unfortunately, we know through uh, biblical theology that that image was marred. It was corrupted by sinfulness. But that needed to be restored. That image that God created us in needed to be refashioned and, uh, and restored. And where do we get the fullness of that image? And that is where we come to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have to look to Christ to see what our true image should look like. Right? It is to Christ. It is Christ's image we must have. It is not our image that we must project. As much as we must have a decent image, but... When we have Christ in our heart, our image begins to look like Jesus. Our image begins to mirror and reflect Jesus. That's the image that we must focus on. Let me share with you some more scriptures. And uh, once again, I'll put it up on the screen. <clears throat> Here are two, two scriptures I'd like you to notice. One is Romans 8 and verse 29. It says, for whom he foreknew. He also predestined, uh, predestined to 
be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So our destiny is to be conformed to the image of his son. That is what God has predestined for humanity. And that's the reason why Jesus came as a human in the incarnation, so that he would give us an opportunity to be conformed to his image, right? So the father sent the son, like we heard in the children's church, that the father was so magnanimous that he shared his son with us. Why? Because we can become like him. We can begin to reflect his image, all right? Look at the second scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, but we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So that is what we, our job is, our, our vocation is. Our participation in the triune God is so that we become like Christ and reflect his image uh, to the glory of the Father and, of course, in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equipping us, empowering us to actually have the image of Christ in us so that we can behold the face of the Father and enjoy the triunity and the communion of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, very quickly, how do we conform to the image of Christ? All right. So I got just two points to share with you uh, with regards to how we conform to the image of Christ. Let me take off the uh, screen share. And the first point I would like to tell you on how we can conform to the image of Christ is by rejecting the false image that this world is telling that you must have. We must first reject the false image of this world or what the world is telling us to have. You know, this world is telling you that you don't look good. This world is telling you that you have a crooked nose. This world is telling you that because you don't look nice, because you know you're, you are not fair and lovely, and your color is not correct, uh, then the world is telling you, you are not loved. You are, you are rejected. You are not accepted. They go on to say, God doesn't love you. You are worthless. No one cares about you. And so, and, and so on and as it goes. This is a lie. This is a false image. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter which race you belong. It doesn't matter whether your, your face is fair or lovely or not. God loves you. Because he looks deeper than your face. He looks deeper from your external image right into your heart, like the song tells us. We must stop believing in the lie that God hates our image. No, he created us so that we would conform to the image of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, and so, unfortunately, because we believe in that lie, so many people are trying to improve their image by trying to, uh, to make ourselves more acceptable. Uh, because many times we cannot accept ourselves. We then try to fake it. We try to project a fake image. We try to Im impress others by falsehood. We think that we will become more acceptable if we do this or that or use some gimmicks or mutilate the flesh like we saw Michael Jackson do. Stop believing that lie. Stop believing the lie that God hates you. That, you know, God will love you only if you have a perfect face. Or that you must do this and that and all kinds of, you know, a list, checklist that you must do before God loves you. That's a lie. That's the false image. Reject that. Secondly, how do we conform to the image of Christ? By focusing on the heart, not 
your image necessarily. You know, by focusing on the heart. And in this regard, let me go back to that scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians that we were reading. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, yeah, I don't, let me just go back to the, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12. Notice once again, it says, we are not co commending ourselves to you again by giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not about what is in the heart. The Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian church, you know, don't be so uh, obsessed with outward appearances, but check the heart, you know, check your heart. You know, don't be worried about your image externally, you know, or don't be worried about that people don't accept you just because of how you look or, you know, how you may appear. Right. Uh, we want to look and make sure what is in the heart. You know, my dad used to say, and there are two things I always remember what my dad said. Uh, two things that always stick in my mind. One, one is he's, I remember him saying, never bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> I don't know why it sticks in my mind, but that is something he taught me. Never bite the hands that feed you. But the second point, which I want to use for my sermon today is, my dad used to say, the face is the index of the mind. The face is the index of the mind. Actually, you could translate mind to heart. The face is the index of the heart. You see, when you focus on the heart, and when you make sure that your heart is correct, that your heart is right, that will help your face to blossom. That will help your face to blossom into the right image. And that is why we must manifest the fruit of the spirit before we focus on the gifts of the spirit. You remember I was referring to the Corinthian church. The apostle Paul chided them. For being too focused on the image, on the on the gifts, because that was an external thing which they were trying to impress people with. It's a mistake that the Corinthian church uh, committed. But the Apostle Paul is saying that when you look into your heart, if you get your heart right, you can use the gift in the right way. And so the question is, when you look into your heart. What do you see? What is it that you recognize in your heart? Right? Uh, is it manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Do you recognize and see the fruit of the Spirit in your heart? Or are you so concerned about your external image that you completely ignore the heart? Once again, the second point, get the heart right. For a good image. Right? Your image is not better by pouring more paint on your face or doing facial surgeries or getting nose lips. You need a heart transplant. <laughs> That's more important. Now, I'm not saying that you know it's wrong for you to get a facelift. <laughs> it's wrong for you to get a nose lift. Please uh, don't mistake me. What I'm trying to say is for the right image, to have the image of Jesus Christ, to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, you need to get your heart right. We all need to get our heart right. And so, brethren, in closing, are you worried about your image? Are you worried that Nobody probably accepts you. Are you worried about you tend of, of, of a tendency to get rejected? Do you feel the sense of rejection just because someone may not like something they see about you externally? And worse still, do you feel 
that God doesn't love you just because you might not have a perfect face? Do you feel a sense of uselessness or hopelessness just because you are unable to project the right image in front of others? In that respect, brethren, check your heart. What kind of a heart do you have? Is it one that reflects love? Is it one that reflects joy and peace? Is it one that reflects patience and kindness? Does your heart reflect goodness and faithfulness? Does your heart reflect gentleness and self-control? That is the image of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a humble heart. It is a right heart that will lift your image and bring color to your face. That's the image you want to have. You know, our earthly image will one day vanish. We won't have, we will have spiritual bodies and I don't know how we are going to look. But one thing I know, we are going to look wonderful for our heavenly father because we will be reflecting the face of Jesus Christ in us. And so brethren, next time you are in front of the mirror and you are making sure that you have a presentable face, making sure you show your hair is adjusted or we just have enough hair to make sure our image is okay. May I also request you to also, as you look at your face, go down a little lower and see what does your heart say. Ask yourself, what is my heart reflecting? Is it reflecting Jesus Christ, the image of Jesus Christ, which indeed will live forever and ever. Let us move to have partake of the communion. If any of you need an, a, a few moments to get your communion ready, uh, this is the time. Bring your communion elements together. As we look to Christ to see what the true image looks like, let us remember that he is the image that we hold up for ourselves. He is the true image that we need to reflect, that we need to mirror for ourselves and for others. And so, brethren, as we partake of the communion, as we come to the table of the Lord, we are coming to Jesus Christ. And as the Holy Spirit convinces you and convicts you that we need to have the image of Christ, let us come to Christ our Lord. Where we have the true image, the best image, the image that will indeed last forever. Shall we pray? Our gracious, loving God, Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, thank you that today we can partake of the body and the blood of Christ, like we have done on a monthly basis for a very long time. And every time we come to the table, Lord, we know that we have acceptance Certainly not rejection. And if any one of us are feeling a sense of rejection, if any one of us are feeling a, a lack of acceptance, let us know that the, at the table we had acceptance. At the table, Jesus even swooped down to wash our feet. And he has shed his blood. He allowed his body to be broken so that we would be healed and we our image would be restored to indeed conform to the very image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so gracious Lord, as we partake of the bread broken for us, as we partake of the wine shed for us, imageries that help us to understand how intimately Jesus Christ loves us, how intimately 
you as Father, Son, Holy Spirit want communion with us. Bless these elements, Lord, as we partake of it. Help us to recognize that we are loved by you. We are cared for by you. We are accepted by you, not because of our external lineage, not because we have a perfect face, not because we have a perfect physique, but because we are your children and you have purchased us by your blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Almighty God and Almighty Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can take your bread. And here is the body, symbolic of the body, broken for us, that God may restore the true image in us, the body of Jesus Christ our Lord. Here is the wine. The blood of Jesus, symbolic of the blood of Jesus, shed for us, washing our false image away and giving us his true image, the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, brethren, let us live now reflecting the true image we were created in and our destiny and our predestination is to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to him be glory forever.